afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, so this talk actually uh, follows very nicely with what um, Roy talked about earlier on, because I, we have also been focusing on mesoscale convective systems. So before I start, I want to particularly acknowledge my co-authors, um, particularly Jie and also Koichi, because they have been doing a lot of the work related to the use of observation data, as well as uh, using uh, the models. So just let me motivate a little bit more, uh, although Roy already gave you a really nice background about why we care about mesoscale convective systems. So first of all, if you look at these uh, pictures over here, so they, they are showing you what a man what an MCS typically look like. So these are what we call cumulonimbus clouds, and they are like pretty, pretty big, generally much larger than what you would think in terms of like a, a, deep, a deep convective cell. So they might be of the dimensions of like hundreds to like thousands of kilometers, and they can also last pretty long. I mean, sometimes up to like 10 to 24 hours. So the reason why we care about MCSs is partly because they are indeed different from other types of convection. So if we take a look at this uh, picture over here, so we are separating precipitation coming from MCSs versus precipitation coming from non-MCSs by using a tracking method. So we have a tool called Flex Tracker, which we use to do that. So here we are looking at uh, over the central United States and looking at the diurnal time, uh, timing of precipitation. And you can see that for MCS precipitation, typically they kind of like maximize around midnight, whereas for other types of convective precipitation, kind of like deep convective cell, they typically kind of maximize around uh, late afternoon. So there is a six hours difference between the two. Also, if you look at the intensity, uh, MCS precipitation is also rather different from non-MCS precipitation. And you can see the dark, the dark line over here showing that MCS precipitation is typically more intense compared to non-MCS precipitation. Therefore, uh, MCS generally, they produce quite a lot of precipitation and contribute importantly to the water cycle. And because of these different properties, I kind of suspect that MCS versus non-MCS precipitation could, could have very different uh, land atmosphere interactions, which we have also been looking at. So some past work, for example, uh, the work that we did back in, uh, published in 2016, show that MCSs in the past 35 years have already been changing. In fact, we have been getting more, and they have been producing more precipitation and lasting longer. And then the work by Andreas um, look at the projected future changes. So, so these two studies essentially suggest that maybe we really need to look at MCSs a little bit more, because it looks like they have been changing in the past, and they will be changing in the future. So we put in more efforts in terms of trying to better simulate this type of convective systems. So, but the difficulty is that, as Roy already mentioned, uh, most climate models can really simulate MCSs. S this is really suggested by, for example, looking at the diurnal cycle of precipitation. So this is a model in the comparison experiment where they show observed diurnal timing of precipitation versus the model simulated diurnal timing. Uh, for kind of like the central United States. So you can see that the model simulated timing is pretty much almost completely opposite to the observation. And then another study also looked at uh, the simulated precipitation intensity. And you can also see that based on CMIF-5 models, they really cannot capture this intense precipitation that is typically associated with MCS. So it's important for us then to look for other ways to help us simulate MCS and understand how they might be changing in the future. So I think there are three different modeling approaches that are really computationally uh, feasible now, at least for climate simulations with our current computational resources. So one method is using limited area model. And um, uh, Roy already showed you some examples, and I'm going to sh show you some examples as well. Another approach is to use global variable resolution model, where you can have a regional refinement that allows you to get down to also higher resolution. So we have been working with this model called AMPAS, which is a non-hydrostatic global variable resolution model. And we are able to, for example, configure a regional refinement down to four kilometers over the United States, where we are testing whether this kind of uh, 
model configuration may get, allow us to simulate MCSs. At the same time, we also have been testing another approach, which is using this so-called multi-scale modeling framework or super parameterization, where you can put in a 2D cloud resolving model within each GCM grid cell. So previous studies have also shown that potentially this is a method where you might be able to get MCSs. So today, because of time, I'm only going to show you some examples using the WOLF model for limited area model and also using the MPAS for global variable resolution model. So this is an example of studies that we published uh, last year where we used the, uh, the WOLF model put in a model configuration domain over here, pretty much kind of like continental United States at four kilometer. And then we're using uh, uh, radar data to evaluate our simulation. So as Royal also talked about, so we look at the different characteristics of MCSs in terms of the lifetime, in terms of the intensity of the precipitation, as well as the size of the MCSs. And you can see comparing observation, which is in blue, with our model simulation, which is in red, for two warm seasons, we can see that the model generally captures these properties of MCSs relatively well. And we are particularly interested in these longer lasting MCSs, because these longer lasting MCSs, typically like 20 hours or so, they are also the ones that are responsible for these more intense uh, precipitation. So then using this particular simulation, then we look into like why some MCSs can last that long, because those are the ones that actually, based on observation, we found that they are the ones that have been changing the most in the last 35 years. So now, uh, then using the simulation, we kind of used our tracking method to identify all the MCSs, and then we composite them based on their lifetime. We particularly look at these MCSs that we call long-lived MCSs that last for between um, 18 to 24 hours. Then we composite their precipitation. So we see that this type of MCSs, uh, they last very long, and indeed they produce quite a lot of precipitation. And if you look at, for example, the stratiform area of the, um, of the MCSs, you can see the diabetic heating produced by the condensation associated with the microphysical processes. And you can see a pretty top-heavy um, diabetic heating. And because of this uh, top-heavy diabetic heating with the vertical gradient of the diabetic heating associated with the potential vorticity, then you would expect that this would generate some kind of meso mesoscale vortex. And indeed, this is what we found. So over the area corresponding to the stratiform precipitation, we indeed see a mesoscale vortex associated with this vertical heating profile. And what this uh, vortex does is essentially is transporting drier and colder air into the MCSs which could cause uh, evaporation of the raindrop and therefore formation of the cold pool and gra gravity waves. And so we believe that this is one mechanism why MCSs can last that long is because it changes the circulation, which provide a positive feedback to enhance the longevity of, uh, of themselves. So to test whether this is indeed the case, we perform two other simulations where we vary the microphysical processes. So here we look at two microphysics schemes. One is called the Morrison scheme, and the other one is called the Thomson scheme. And I'm not going to go into the detail of the microphysics, but except to tell you that these two microphysics schemes, they do produce MCSs that are somewhat different in terms of the area of the stratiform cloud and the amount of stratiform precipitation. So now we wanted to see wh whether the differences associated with the microphysics can affect the macrophysical properties of the MCSs, such as their lifetime or propagation speed, et cetera. So here we found that uh, using two microphysics schemes, one of the microphysics, particularly the Thomson scheme, actually give us a more top-heavy heating profile associated with the formation of the snow, which is different from the um, from the Morrison scheme. So now, as I mentioned before, the vertical gradient of the heating profile can generate potential vorticity and therefore mesoscale vortex. And indeed, we found that if you compare the circulation in the Morrison scheme versus the Thompson scheme, you see that the Thompson scheme indeed produced a more well-formed mesoscale vortex 
compared to the Morrison scheme because of the differences in the heating profile. And therefore, based on what I mentioned before, potentially the Thomson scheme simulation may give you longer-lived MCSs. So to verify that, we look at the PDF of the lifetime of MCSs. The black curve is based on observation, and then the Morrison scheme and the Thomson scheme are shown in the blue and the red. And indeed, because of the differences in the microphysics affecting the heating profile and the mesoscale vortex, we do see that the Thomson scheme produced MCSs that are more longer lived compared to the other microphysics scheme, suggesting that even in a convection permitting simulation, microphysics could be pretty important because it does affect the macrophysical structure, such as lifetime of MCSs. So after doing uh, this kind of wolf simulation, we have also beginning to look at global variable resolution simulation. So this is uh, an app, the MPAS model that we have been using. So some of the simulations we configure are putting a high resolution region over the US at four kilometer, but we also tested it at 12 kilometer and 36, uh, at, at 25 kilometer to see what differences does it make when you have different uh, resolution in the refined area. So here we are using a short weather forecast just to test out how well this uh, model performed. So what I'm showing you here are hof muller diagram based on observed precipitation and also the simulation at three different resolution. At four kilometer, we simply turn off the convection scheme. And then at 12 and 25, we do use convection scheme. And in this case, we use the uh, so-called Zhang and McFarland scheme. And we perform short initialized forecasts and concatenate them into a long time series. Uh, looking at, for example, in this case, looking at April, which is spring season. We also apply our MCS tracking method so that we can identify all the precipitation associated with MCSs. So this is total precipitation. And these are showing MCS precipitation only. And you can see that there are actually, in, in the month of April, quite a lot of different MCSs formed. And they propagate. And uh, the four kilometer simulation uh, performs uh, somewhat better than the other two. If, but although even at 12 and 25 kilometer, we see that the models were able, is able to actually simulate MCSs too in springtime. But then starting looking at the summertime, then we begin to see that, first of all, MCS precipitation is quite a bit weaker compared to springtime. And in this case, the four kilometer is doing quite a bit better than the, the other two, although even at four kilometer, the model is not doing that great. And I believe partly is associated with the microphysics scheme that we use, which is based on the global climate model. But, be but to better understand the differences between springtime versus summertime. So I'd like to show you the large scale environment between the two seasons. This is one particular case where we look at an, MC an MCS in April, observation and the three different simulation. <coughs> you can see that typically during springtime, MCSs are associated with synoptic systems. So you have a low pressure system, baroclinic waves propagating through, and lots of low level jet kind of like transporting moisture. You can see the low level jet and therefore formation of a large area organized convection with really deep um, cloud. We show the red part, which is the MCS cloud shield. So this is a typical kind of situation for spring. But if you look at the summertime, the uh, synoptic environment is actually very different. So in this case, typically, you might see a high pressure center sitting over the central United States. And then you can actually see MCSs forming kind of like ahead of short wave trough, and a little bit of uh, low level jet, not as strong as the springtime feeding into the system. So very, very different synoptic kind of environment uh, where MCSs are generated between the two seasons. So if you look at the predictability of the large scale environment themselves, here we look at the root mean square error of um, the 850 hectopascal humidity, but you can also look at uh, 500 uh, hectopascal height, et cetera. You can see that the error growth associated with the summertime is much faster than the springtime. And therefore, it is quite a bit more difficult to simulate MCSs in summer than in spring. But potentially, another reason could be that not only the last sphere environment is important for MCSs, but potentially in the summertime, land surface condition 
evapotranspiration, et cetera, could also be very important uh, in summer as well. So lastly, I'd just like to show you another example where, again, we use the MPAS model, but uh, really looking at the gray zone resolution because even with a variable resolution model with a four kilometer resolution region over the US, first of all, is relatively expensive. And secondly, I can't really just turn off the convection scheme everywhere because outside the refined region, I still need to have a convection scheme. So this is why we have been looking at another kind of configuration where we do 12 kilometer over the US and 46 kilometer outside. And we are testing three different convection schemes. One is typically used in global climate models, the Zhang and McFadden scheme. And then another one is so-called growth fighter scheme, which is a scale-aware parameterization. And then another simulation where we simply just turn off convection scheme. And we ran for four months um, from April to August. And we see that with the growth fighter scheme, actually, we have a pretty successful simulation, the fact that this, with this scheme, the scale-aware parameterization actually can simulate the precipitation quite well. And partly is because in this area at 12 kilometer resolution, the ground fighter scheme actually is not way too active. So a lot of the precipitation is still generated by convective precipitation compared to, let's say, the, um, the uh, Zhang and McFadden scheme where a lot of the precipitation would be generated by the convection scheme. So if we look at precipitation diurnal cycle, we see that the Zhang and McFadden scheme is pretty typical of any other G uh, scheme used in the GCM, where they exaggerate the diurnal timing, and typically in the afternoon, whereas the gravel fighter scheme is performing quite well in terms of capturing the diurnal precipitation. So this is just a quick summary of what, where we are. So I show you some regional convection permitting simulations using the Wolf model, and they are pretty successful in terms of capturing MCSs. Um, and then we found this positive feedback coming from the diabetic heating onto the longevity of the MCSs, which is really important for simulating these long-lasting, more intense MCSs. And then I also show you examples of global variable resolution simulations at four kilometer. And then uh, we found that summertime is much more difficult to simulate. And then we also show example of the gray zone simulation at 12 kilometer. Potentially, we are now more ex uh, really exploring this ground fighter scheme a bit more in, in, at this type of resolution. So thank you very much for your attention.